Oh, you're reading tweets. I mean, whilst I'm on the subject tweets, come on, guys. What's the world coming to? Ajib. You know, it's like we're all sheep that we can't even think for ourselves in this day and age. I mean, you'll get people like, you know, the Kardashians, or, you know, Victoria Beckham or somebody like this, tweeting that I've broken wind. And you know what? You're laughing, but it happens. You'll retweet that. You will retweet that. Guys, you know, honestly, you understand verses of the Quran. You know, whatever Allah guides cannot be misguided. And if Allah doesn't guide, and if Allah doesn't guide, that person can never be guided. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa naqibatu lil muttaqeen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Habib al Mursaleen Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'een wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsan ila yom iddina ma ba'd. Qala jalla wa ala inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد قال جل وعلا يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا وقودها الناس والحجارة عليها ملائكة غلاغ شداد لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كلكم راع وكلكم مسؤول عن رعيته وقال عليه الصلاة والسلام إن لربك عليك حقا وإن لنفسك عليك حقا ولأهلك عليك حقا فأعط كل ذي حق حقا أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام respected علماء respected elders brothers little ones السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته after praising the Almighty Allah سبحانه وتعالى and sending salutations upon our beloved Nabi Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم I begin as always by first thanking you my host for giving me this opportunity to convey the message of Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I pray to the Almighty Allah that Allah accepts these efforts of yours in listening to this message as I pray to the Almighty Allah that Allah accepts these efforts of mine in trying to deliver the message of Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as it was revealed upon our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in its true and pure form over 1400 years ago without changing and without diluting the message of Allah and he's Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My young friends, I'm going to speak today about the dangers, the harms of this modern technology. Social media, the internet, the smartphone, the iPhone, the Samsung, whatever it may be. Benefits, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has Mawlana just touched upon them and even then you know them better than me and him put together you've been you're born in this area you, you're on it on a daily basis so I'm going to talk about the harms I'm not going to mention the depression some people say it causes cancer the smartphone forget the cancer forget that we're becoming Zombies, slowing of the mind, the addiction, forget all that. I'm going to talk about the harms from an Islamic perspective. How is it harming our Iman, our Islam? The harms with regards to the Akhirah. We are a very blessed people and a very fortunate people. Allah indeed has showered us with many blessings. 
So many blessings when do do ni'mat Allah la tuhsuwa. If here and now you were to count the blessings of Allah upon you, I swear by Allah, your life would come to an end. But well, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not come to an end. And a great blessing upon us is this. That Allah has made our lives a lot easier than the lives of our grandparents and our great-grandparents. Let me give you an example. My grandparents, if they wanted food, then my young friends, they would have to plow the land. It was as simple as that. They wanted wheat for chapati, then they would have to plow the land. You don't plow the land, there's no food. There was no such thing as Asda, Lidl, Morrison's, Walmart. <clears throat> you by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are so blessed and so fortunate. Never mind food and plowing the land. You don't even have to leave the comfort of your house to earn a livelihood. How many people today? earn thousands just sitting at home in front of a machine, in front of the computer. You don't even have to leave your home. You want something to eat? All you've got to do is click a button. And whatever you desire will be at your doorstep. My grandparents, they wanted to speak to someone in another country. It couldn't happen. <clears throat> How would they communicate? Telegram? Writing letters? And you know what? What I can still remember to this day and age, for those of you at my age, you'll be able to relate to this. The audio cassette. As a family, we'd sit down and we'd put this audio cassette inside the tape and we'd record a message. <clears throat> you know, we'd speak to our grandparents in Pakistan. The whole family. And then we'd wait for somebody to go to Pakistan and we'd give it to them. And they'd take it and hand it, deliver it. And you, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, here and now, you can speak to anyone in any part of the world. And not only speak to them, you can actually see them whilst you're speaking to them. Indeed, these are blessings of Allah. This modern technology, indeed, is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's only a blessing if it's used in the right way. If it's not used in the right way, then my young friend, you are messing with fire. And whoever messes with fire will burn. In my opinion, there is nothing that will corrupt the Iman. And there is nothing that will take you quicker to Jahannam than this modern technology if it is not used in the right way. Look how easy it is to commit sin. You know, when we were growing up, even sinning wasn't easy. I'm giving give you an example. When we were young, guys would like to go to nightclubs. So you know what they'd do? It wasn't just as simple as going to a nightclub. They'd plan it weeks in advance. Yeah. They'd want to go to a nightclub, pick up a bird, enjoy themselves. Yeah. They'd have to plan it weeks in advance. They needed money for it. So they're going to have to get that money from somewhere. 
and then they'd make, they'd make dua. Que Allah make it so that my father and mother go to sleep straight after Isha. So they don't get caught. Yeah. So they'd wait for the mother and father to sleep and then they would slowly sneak and leave the house. And they'd take their clothes with them. The ones that they were going to wear at the nightclub. They wouldn't wear them at home. They'd take them with them, go to some service station, McDonald's, get changed, put on the gear, the gel, comb the hair, and it wasn't as simple as going to a nightclub. So if he lived in Bradford, there was no way on God's earth he was going to go in any nightclub in Bradford. Because he did not want to take the chance of getting caught by anyone that knew him. So if it was a Bradfordian, he'd probably go an hour away. You know, somewhere, Blackburn, Bolton, where nobody knew him. And he'd do what he wanted to do. And he'd make sure he's back before Fajr Salah, before his dad gets up. And what he would do before he went, it was probably leave a window open. And he'd climb the toilet pipe. And that's how he would sneak back inside his house. That's what you had to do to commit sin. This type of sin. And today, you've got apps for it. Your game on. She's game on. It don't even cost a dime. You choose the time and place, she'll be there. Or she chooses the time and place, and you'll be there. This is why I say, my young friends, if it's not used in the right manner, there's nothing that will take you to Jahannam quicker than this. Let me share with you the harms. You've gone online for something good. Let me share, you, let me share the harms with regards to this. You've gone online for something good. Now what's something good? Like as Malan was explaining. You've gone online to learn the deen of Allah. There's nothing better than that. Learning the deen of Allah. Now what happens with the masses? You've gone online to learn the deen of Allah. Looking at some website. Speaking to someone on the internet, taking advice. Thinking he's a scholar. Or you're listening to YouTube videos. Many of us don't even know who this individual is. Many of us. We don't even know whether he's a scholar or not. Is he an alim? Is he not an alim? We don't even know his school of thought. The website that we're visiting, we have no idea. Is this a Sunni website? I'm talking about the average guy here, you know, the layman. He does not know. Is this a Shia website? Is this an Ahmadi website? Is it a Qadiani website? Is it an extreme website? Or is it, you know what, some, some what you call an enemy of Islam has established this website to mis, mis, misguide or mislead the believers. He doesn't have a clue. And we're taking our deen from there. And now does he do research with regards to it and ask people with regards to it. And he's taking his deen from there on a regular basis. How many people join ISIS like this? Went on websites, listened to lectures, were influenced by their version of deen, and before you know it, innocent young people were killed in Syria and Iraq. There are people that I know that have become Ahmadis. Why? Because they watch the Ahmadi channel. So what they see is this guy with a, a mama on, a beard on, this libas, and what he thinks this is a Sunni Muslim. And because his knowledge with regards to deen is very meager, he can't differentiate. He doesn't know what he's saying is, whether it's right or wrong. 
How many people have left the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He's gone online looking for a particular thing. All of a sudden there's a lecture pops up. Does God exist? Shaitan gets the better of him and he clicks on it. He starts listening to it. Shaitan gets the better of him. Now he's getting interested and he starts listening to a few more lectures. He doesn't resort to his local scholar to ask for guidance. And before you know it, Shaitan's working on him in his house all alone and he's left the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My young friends, do you know, do we know the consequence of dying on any path other than that of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions of Rasulullah? Do we know the consequences of that? Do we know the consequences of dying without Iman? Dying without the correct beliefs? Open the book of Allah. This is no joke. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونِ ذَلِكَ لَمِنْ يَشَاءُ there's one thing that Allah can't tolerate is kufr and shirk. Anything else that you can do, if Allah wishes, Allah will forgive it. Kufr and shirk as sins. Not only has jannah become haram, Allah says, Allah. If you come with an earth full of gold and present that to Allah on that day, Without Iman, you died without Iman, without Islam. And you offer an earth full of gold to Allah. Ki Allah, don't punish me. Take this earth full of gold. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ أَحَدِهِمْ مِلُّ الْأَرْضِ Nothing will be accepted. It's as simple as this. You cock up, you mess up. The difference is heaven and hell. There's no such thing as second chance. The deen of Allah is not a joke. The aqa'id and beliefs are not a joke. My young friends, look how careful you are when it comes to dunyavi matters. Your boiler is not working at home. You've heard about dodgy plumbers. What will you do? You won't just call anyone that comes to mind. You'll ask around. You'll ask for advice. And you only call somebody that's been recommended. Why? Because you fear the consequence of a dodgy plumber. You don't want your house to be flooded. Many websites selling medication, you suffer from a particular illness. You won't take this in your own hands and now, just buy any type of medication from the internet. Because you know the consequence. You, you, you become very wise when it comes to your, you know, your health. You will do that. But okay, you'll ask your doctor, you'll ask those that are in the profession. Because you know the consequences can be fatal. Why is it that you take a gamble with your deen? You know, you might be able to tolerate those consequences with regards to a dodgy plumber or medication. But believe me, my young friend, you will not be able to tolerate one second of the consequence if you mess up in terms of your deen in the akhirah. Look how conscious the companions of Rasulullah were when it came to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They didn't just say that deen from anyone, our salafu salihin, just because he had an imam on his head, or he claimed that he was an alim, he had a long sunnah beard, a thaw. No, my young friends. Even when people narrated the hadith of Rasulullah and used the word, qala Rasulullah, they didn't just take it. They say to them, Sambulana rijalakum. Tika, you're saying the Prophet وسلم, said this, but where have you got it from? So he'd say, okay, I heard it from so and so. Fine, who did he hear it from? He heard it from so and so. Who did he hear it from? Till they did not take that chain back to the Prophet. And these narrators were not reliable, they would not accept that saying of the Prophet. They were so cautious that you had people like Sayyidina Abu Huraira from amongst the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala ajma'in. The hadiths that we've received today, the most that we've received from is none other than Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala We've received over 5,000 hadiths from Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala 
Sayyidina Abu Huraira embraced Islam in year 7 when uh, Khandak was conquered. And after that day and night his passion was the Prophet ﷺ. He would stay with the Prophet ﷺ. In Hazar, in Safar, wherever the Prophet ﷺ went, Sayyidina Abu Huraira would be there. And as a result he's narrated over 5,000 hadiths. He stayed in the company of Rasulullah from year 7 till the last breath of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But there were companions out there who declared the kalima la ilaha illallah at the dawn of Islam. When Islam was born, they uttered the kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. For example, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala. Sayyidina Zubair radiallahu ta'ala. Yet when you look at their hadiths that they've narrated, they nothing in comparison to the hadiths Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala narrated. Why? The muhaddisin mentioned because they were afraid, they were cautious when it came to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were afraid, they heard the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, مَنْ كَذَبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّ مَقَدُهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Whoever attributes a lie to me, he should make his abode in the fire of hell. They were afraid that they don't end up relating and attributing things to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hadn't said. You had people like Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al-Nsari radiallahu ta'ala an. He traveled all the way to Egypt for the sake of one hadith. And my young friends, it wasn't because he did not know the hadith of the Prophet When he got to Egypt, he met a man called Uqba. When Uqba saw the great companion of Rasulullah he said, Ma ja bika ya ba Ayyub. Oh Abu Ayyub, what brings you from Madinah to Munawwara to Egypt? You know, in those days, it take a month to get to Egypt. It wasn't as simple as just booking your ticket on uh, you know, EasyJet or Ryanair and, you know, um, getting to different corners of the globe. It wasn't as simple as that. People in those days, you know, when they would travel, they would make wasiya. You know, in case I die, make sure you do X, Y, and Z. <coughs> Difficult terrain, lack of water, burning heat. When he got to Egypt, Uqba asked, Ma ja bika ba Ayyub. So Abu Ayyub radiallahu ta'ala responded, a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And listen to this, he said, out of all those that directly heard this from the Prophet, peace be upon him, only you and I remain alive. So he'd heard this hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. His ears heard it directly from the blessed tongue of the Prophet ﷺ. So he said, relate the hadith with regards to concealing the faults of a believer. So Uqba narrated the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever conceals the faults of a believer in this world, Allah will conceal his faults on the day of judgment. Allah will conceal his faults in the akhirah. So he said to him, Sadaq, you've spoken the truth. Now look how cautious he was. Because a long time had passed since he heard the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He wanted to make sure, does he still retain the hadith? Does he still recall it just like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uttered? And he wasn't prepared to narrate it till he was sure in his heart and mind that what he recalls and remembers and retains is exactly how the Prophet ﷺ related it the day he was in the gathering of Rasulullah ﷺ. Who hasn't heard of Imam Malik? Rahimahullah? Four schools of thought. Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi and Ahmad. He was the Imam of Medina. Prophet ﷺ mentioned him in, in, in the hadith. He would only narrate hadith, sahih hadith. And he would only narrate hadith from reliable narrators. <coughs> Such a big scholar, but when it came to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so cautious he was, that my young friends, he did not start giving fatwa till he did not resort to his teachers like Imam Rabia and others, until they did not tell him, Ki, O Malik, you are in a position to give fatwa only then did Imam Malik start giving fatwa. You had Abu Zura al-Razi, who was a student of Imam al-Bukhari, a master of hadith. You know, Abu Zura would say, I'm surprised at people that they give fatwa in talaq. When it comes to talaq, masail with regards to talaq. I'm surprised that they give fatwa with regards to talaq. Yet they memorize less than 100,000 hadith. They memorize less than 100,000 hadith. Yani, in his opinion, no one is in a, was in a position to say, to give fatwa when it came to talaq, if he'd memorized less than 100,000 hadiths. This is how cautious they were, because they knew 
Now you know when it comes to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's no joke. And if you mess up, you can end up in the fire of hell. My young friends, <coughs> this can be the consequence if this modern technology is not used in the right way. This is why it's important. I'm not saying for one second, yeah, don't use it. Because you know, as well as I know, it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. What I will say is, take deen from your local scholars. And at the same time, I will say, if you're going to go online, then ask your local scholars, which website should I visit? Which scholar should I converse and speak to online for my religious problems and guidance? Which bayans or bayans or which scholars should I listen to on YouTube? And stick to that. Inshallah, if you stick to this guidance, hopefully the shaitan will not be able to get the better of you. But if you don't have a ta'aluk with your local scholars and you just ask Mufti Google for everything, then the chances are, my young friends, you are digging your own grave. So these are the consequences when you've gone on it for a good intention. Let me take it down a notch. You've gone on it for something that's maba in Islam. Something that's permissible, something in which there's no ajr, there's no reward, and in something in which there's no guna. For example, <coughs> you're just chit-chatting online, don't you chit-chat? Or you're playing games online, or you're reading tweets. I mean, while someone on the subject tweets, come on guys, what's the world coming to? Ajeeb. You know, it's like we're all sheep that we can't even think for ourselves in this day and age. I mean, you get people like, you know, the Kardashians, or, you know, Victoria Beckham or somebody like this, tweeting that I've broken wind. And you know what? You're laughing, but it happens. You'll retweet that. You will retweet that. Guys, you know, honestly, you understand verses of the Quran. You know, wherever Allah guides, cannot be misguided and if Allah doesn't guide and if Allah doesn't guide that person can never be guided if Allah doesn't guide if Allah doesn't give that understanding then that person can never be guided what a waste of a life you know if that is not a waste of a life then what is you know the sad thing is many of us many of us don't even realize because we don't even know our purpose in life. Many of us don't even know why Allah has created us. You know, this thought doesn't even cross our mind. This thought doesn't even cross our mind that Allah has created us for a purpose. My young friends, there is not a single thing within this universe that Allah hasn't created for a purpose. And you and me, Allah has also created us, uh, us for a purpose. What's that purpose? Our purpose, Allah created us, places on this dunya for one reason and one reason only. That is the only reason Allah has placed you and me on this dunya and that is that you worship Allah, that is that you acknowledge Allah, that is that you bow down before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is your purpose in life. That is my purpose in life. Let me ask you one single question, my young friends. Your purpose in life is to worship Allah. How much worship have you done? Whether you're 50 years of age, 40 years of age, 35 years of age, 15 years of age. How far have you come in fulfilling the purpose of your creation? Let's say Allah has given you 60 years of life. My young friend. Disregard the first 15. Allah has given you 60 years of life. Disregard the first 15. Why? Because you know for the first 15 you're still asleep. All you do by day and by night is play. How many years have you got left? 45. 
Thereafter, my young friends, every single day you sleep for eight hours. More or less. Average guy sleeps for eight hours. Eight hours is a third of a day. It's a third of a week. It's a third of a year. It's a third of your life. Take away another 15 years. How many have you got left? You started from 60, you've got 30 left. For those that work, average guy works eight hours a day. Again, it's a third of a day, third of a week, third of your life. And you work for the dunya. Take away another third. How many of you got left? 15. You started from 60. Your purpose in life is to worship Allah. You've got 15. You haven't even bowed down. Every single day it takes you about half an hour to get to work and half an hour to come back from work. Every single day you have three meals. Breakfast, lunch, supper. You spend about an hour. Every day you're on the internet, your mobile phone. How much have you got left? Nothing. My young friend, Allah placed you on this dunya to worship. Where's your worship gone? When you're six foot under and when that angel comes to take your soul, this is when the game comes to an end and the joke comes to an end. You know, for those that have taken this life as a joke, Abbas, no meaning. We're here like animals, do as we please, when we please, how we please. Who dare question us? Who dare guide us? My young friend, when you stand before your master, on a day when Allah will be angry like never before, and he will ask you one simple question, لَن تَزُولَ قَدَمَ عَبْدٍ حَتَّى يُسْأَلَ الْأَرْبَعِنْ أَنْ أُمْرِهِ فِي مَا أَفْنَا وَأَنْ شَبَابِهِ فِي مَا أَبْلَا وَأَنْ مَالِهِ مِنْ أَيْنَ إِكْتَسَبَ وَفِي مَا أَنْفَقَ وَأَنْ عِلْمِهِ مَاذَ أَمِلَ فِيهِ You will not move from that plane of resurrection, Jannah to one side, Jahannam to the other side. You will be standing before your Khalik, your Malik, your Razik, the one and only true God. And he'll ask you this simple question. I gave you a life of 60 years. What did he do with it? And he will take you to account for every second that you lived in the dunya. What will your response be? My young friend, if you do not have an answer here and now with regards to what you've done with your life, what will your answer be? when you stand before your master. And then you had people that were that focused. That focus when it came to their purpose in life, when it came to accountability, when it came to meeting their Allah, that you had people like Hafiz al-Munziri. Hafiz al-Munziri, my young friends, was so focused that he only left his madrasa on a Jummah, for Salatul Jummah. That is the only time he left his madrasa for Salatul Jummah. So, so my young friends, you know, his son was a muhaddis, a master of hadith. When his son died, he offered his janazah inside the madrasa. And he escorted the body to the external door of the madrasa. And when he got there, tears began to flow from his eyes. Addressing his son, he said, Oh my son, oh my beloved son. I now leave you in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did not participate in the burial of his own son. Because you know, these people, my young friends, it wasn't just about worship. Every second wasn't about worship. They were so focused in terms of their akhirah, it was about where you get the maximum return for every second that you spend. You are people like Ubaid ibn Ya'ish. Ubaid ibn Ya'ish was a teacher of Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim. For 30 years, this man did not eat with his own hands. He says, I would sit and my sister would take the morsel and she would place it inside my mouth whilst I was occupied with writing the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 30 years, he couldn't find time to eat that his sister would place the morsel whilst he would write the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You're all Hanafis here. 
Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullah had a student called Imam Abu Yusuf rahimahullah. Listen to this. He's on his deathbed. He's on the verge of leaving this world. His student Qadi Ibrahim al-Kufi comes to visit him. And he's unconscious. He's fainted. He gains consciousness. And he says to Qadi Ibrahim al-Kufi, what is your opinion with regards to such a such a mas'ala? Qazi Ibrahim al-Kufi says, O Abu Yusuf, in this state, where you can barely keep your head upright, you want to talk about masail, you want to discuss masail. Imam Abu Yusuf rahimahullah says, what's wrong with it? O Ibrahim, it may benefit someone, let us discuss. And then he asked him, oh, Ibrahim, what's your opinion with regards to Ramyul Jimar? You know, pelting the shaitan. Is it afzal to do it rakibal or mashian? That when you go pelt the shaitan in Mina, should you do it walking or whilst you're on a mount? So he says, I said rakiban. Whilst you're on a mount? He says, no. I said mashian then. Whilst you're on foot? He said, no. I said, you tell me. Sayyid Abu Yusuf Rahimullah said, if you're going to stop there for dua, Allah. yeah, then mashian, otherwise rakiban. He says, he said this, I left. He says, I hadn't even got to his external door. And I could hear the screams and cries. Abu Yusuf had left the world. Look how focused they were in terms of their <laughs> akhirah. What every second meant to them in obedience to Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you and I. Look what, it, what we're tweeting. Hours we spend, Mulana mentioned. What, an eighth Mulana, and a quarter of a day? We're spending on social media. Your wife's been waiting all day. You come home, she gives you your meal. You don't even acknowledge her. What do you do? You take out your mobile phone. It's a disease. Or she's on her mobile phone. Or you're both on your mobile phones. You're sitting together on the same leather sofas. So close together, yet your walls apart. I'm sure every single guy in this room can relate to this because it's happening in every single house, more or less. Both of you sitting together on the same sofa and you're miles apart. Every second, every day is passing, you're drifting apart. Your husband and wife, you've taken vows and you're drifting apart. It gets to such a stage that you're becoming fonder of others. And before you know it, talaq. He's gone his way, She's gone her way, and the children have ended up in care. Where did it begin from? This modern technology. You have people that play games online day and night. And I'm not just talking about young people here, I'm talking about middle-aged people. So much so that some of them are so addicted, they don't even know how many children they've got. They don't even work. You know, the wife's the breadwinner. And the games they play have an impact on their heart and mind and their way of thinking and their behavior. And what they've seen in those games is that's how they behave towards their wife and their children in a violent manner. How long is she going to put with this? Before you know it, this marriage also comes to an end. My young friends, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you stand before him, he's going to ask you with regards to your wife and your children. You are supposed to save them from the fire of hell. They have rights upon you. And Allah will take you to account and task with regards to your wife and children. You know, when Prophet Sallallahu when the Muslims migrated from Mecca to Medina to Al-Manawara, Nabi Kareem Sallallahu established brotherhood. 
He made the Muhajireen and the Ansar brothers. And the Prophet Sallallahu established brotherhood between Sayyidina Salman and Sayyidina Abu Dardar radiallahu ta'ala So one day Sayyidina Salman went to visit Sayyidina Abu Dardar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He saw Umm Darda, his wife, wearing shabby clothes. You know, she wasn't adorning herself and beauting herself and preparing herself like women prepare themselves for their husbands. So he asked, what's the matter? So she put it very politely, can you know, brother, your brother Abu Darda, he has no interest in the dunya. <coughs> Meaning he has no interest in me. Okay. Meanwhile, Abu Darda came, he prepared some food and gave it to Sayyidina Salman. And he said, look, I'm fasting, you eat. Sayyidina Salman said, no, I'm not going to eat. Not till you don't eat. So he made him break his fast and they both sat together and they ate. They went to sleep in the evening. In the early part of the night, Sayyidina Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala woke up for tahajjud. Sayyidina Salman said, go back to sleep. Short while after, he went back to sleep. He got up again. Again, Sayyidina Salman said, go back to sleep. In the latter part of the night, Sayyidina Salman woke up and told him to wake up and they both read tahajjud. And then Sayyidina Salman radiallahu ta'ala explained, inna li rabbika alika haqqa. That your Lord has rights upon you. Wa inna li nafsika alika haqqa. Your body has rights upon you. Wa li ahlika alika haqqa. Your wife have rights upon you. Your children have rights upon you. Fa'ti kulla di haqqin haqqa. Give everyone their fair due. My young friends, when it's not permissible to spend the day as well as the night bowing down before your master. In Islam, when it's not permissible to spend so much time worshipping Allah, when you're neglecting other hukuki wajibah, then where will it be permissible to spend that much time on this modern technology, whether it's social media, whether it's a smartphone, whatever it may be, whether it's playing games, yeah. where will it be permissible? These are the consequences when you're doing something permissible and something good. Can you imagine the harms when you're doing something haram? I'm only going to get time to share one, one haram thing with you, and I'm going to do that and I'm going to conclude because your isha is up. 7.45. 7.45. This one hand will take it to more close there. How many different types of zina do we expose ourselves to on a daily basis? How many different types? You know, zina is not a small sin. It's such a sin, okay, never mind commit it. Allah says, La taqrabu zina, don't even go near it. But okay, it's such a sin that the Prophet Sallallahu in one hadith has mentioned, Man zana aw shariba al-khamar Naza Allahu minhu al-eeman Kama yakhlaw al-insana al-qamisa min ra'sih Whoever commits zina or takes intoxicants, weed, whatever it may be, Allah takes out his iman just like one of you takes off his qamis above his head. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi in another hadith mentioned the different types of zina. Zina of the eyes, he mentioned, looking at what you shouldn't be looking at. Zina of the ears, listening to what you shouldn't be listening to. Zina of the tongue, speaking to those that you shouldn't be speaking to. Zina of the hands, touching what you shouldn't be touching. Zina of the feet, Walking towards what you shouldn't be walking towards. You know, bearing this hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, how many different types of zina? One that goes online, how many different types of zina does he expose himself to on a daily basis? And you know what the sad thing is? The sad thing is, because everyone's doing it, it makes it right. The thought doesn't even cross our mind. Al-baliyyut wa idha ammat khaffat. That's the sad thing. The thought doesn't even cross our mind that what we're doing is wrong. You know, when a person doesn't even regard a sin as a sin, where will he ever receive the tawfiq of repenting and turning to Allah and making tawbah? We expose ourselves to the zina of the ears, listening to things that we shouldn't be listening to. We expose ourselves to the zina of a tongue, Speaking to those that we shouldn't speaking to. How many times a day we're committing this sin? The heart desires. 
The zina of the eyes, looking at what you shouldn't be looking at. What am I referring to? People's profiles. Obscene pictures. I'm referring to watching filth. And you know this last one. You know what I'm referring to, don't you guys? Watching filth. Yeah. You know this last one. Who's not I? Illa man asima rabbuk. Illa man sha'Allah. Those Allah's protected. But now you know in this day and age, the small, the big, the young, the old, the male, the female, to some degree, everyone's at it except those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected. Can you imagine if Allah exposes you on the Day of Judgment? You know, if one of you were, to, uh, were caught, let's say I were to catch a particular individual, and he knew that I knew, and I said to him, you know what, I'm going to tell your mother and father, how would you feel? Yeah, I'll tell anyone, but don't tell my mother and father. And you know what? You'll do anything to make sure that I don't tell your mother and father. Why? Because you know, you know deep down that you know what? It's below the belt. There's nothing more shameful than that. And you know you'll never ever be able to look at your mother and father in the eye if they ever came to know this is what my son watches and this is what my son spends time doing. My young friend, if this is how you feel in the dunya and you fear this humiliation and shame, if your mother and father were to know about it, then what will you do on the day of judgment? How will you face your Allah? How will you face your Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? My young friend, you know, on that day, Allah is going to humiliate people. Allah, that is the day where Allah will take revenge and punish and reward. Many people will be raised in a particular manner because Allah is going to humiliate them on that day. Can you imagine okay, that portion of your life when you were doing that? Yeah, is played in front of the whole of mankind. 124,000 prophets, your mother's there, your father's there, your relatives there. The whole of mankind is there and Allah humiliates you on the plane of resurrection. How will you feel? How will you feel? You know, while I'm on the subject, there's so many youngsters here. You know, those that watch this filth. You know, once they watch this filth, what do they do? You're going to have to release. If you couldn't control your desire and you watch this film, you know, after watching it, do you think you'll be able to control yourself? No way on God's earth. Again, إِلَّا مَنْ أَسِمَ book, Except those Allah protects. How are you going to release? Let me tell you. Either you're going to commit zina. Okay? You're going to either commit zina or you're going to either take advantage of those that are vulnerable within society. And I'm talking about children. You know, all these pedophiles, where do you think it begins from? They watch this filth and as a result of which become, they become blind up here. Do you understand? And then they start doing things which I can't even, you know, bring to my tongue. You don't do this, what will you do? You'll marry your hand. All these things are not permissible. But okay, with regards to the last, you know, we live at times in an environment where they encourage this. And they say, okay, you know, it's good for a person to get to know his body and explore. Astaghfirullah. Yeah. The Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in a hadith, Seven people which Allah has cursed and which Allah will not look at with mercy on the day of judgment. And one of them is Naqihul Yad, the one that marries his hand. But in a weak narration, it's mentioned 
that some people will be resurrected on the day of judgment in such a condition that their hands will be pregnant. Their hands will be pregnant. Why? Whilst they were in the dunya, they used to play with their organs. Can you imagine being resurrected on the day of judgment? Yeah. Where your hand is pregnant. Can you imagine the humiliation? You know, whilst I'm on the subject, my young friends, there is no benefit in terms of the akhirah and there is no benefit in terms of the dunya. Let me share with you some of the harms in terms of the dunya as hopefully it will prove beneficial. And I'm sharing with you information that I've accumulated and received over the years after having spoken to many youngsters like you. This disease can lead to what? You know what? Premature ejaculation. This disease can lead to premature ejaculation. Can you imagine the humiliation? Let me put a scenario to you. You've got married. You're coming to your wife. Okay? Newly married, you're coming to your wife. You abused yourself as a child while you were growing up. You did what I've just mentioned. Yeah? And that was your pastime. You're coming to your wife and you realize, you know what? You can't even satisfy her need because you dropped the wicket in advance. How will you look at your wife in the eye? Okay, you know what? Firstly, you'll get away with it. Firstly, you'll get away with it. A week down the line, you want it to, you want it to fulfill your need. You came again. And you know what? You leaked again without satisfying her need. A week down the line, and again, she'll, she'll, she'll overlook it. You know what? She'll overlook it once, she'll overlook it twice. She'll overlook it three times. At the end of the day, she's a human being. She's a human being, and she also has needs. Okay? What do you think she'll do? Wait for you for 10, you know, wait for you for another five years till you get it right. And you've sorted out the problem. No, my young friend. Let me tell you what's happening and what has happened in cases that I've dealt with. Yeah? She'll pack her bags and she will go. She'll want out of the marriage. She'll come to her mother and father and say, you know what? He's not for me. So her mother and father will naturally ask, okay, why? You know, what's wrong with this guy? He's really good. He speaks really well. MashaAllah, he's really good with us. He treats you well. Why do you want to break the marriage? She's going to have to tell him something. And that's when she'll tell. That fine, he's good in all these departments, but he's not a man. Your mother and father will also find out. Because they want to know why the marriage is broken up. How will you show your face to your mother and father and society once they find out that you're not a man? Believe me, my young friend, there is no bigger humiliation for a man more than that. That you know what? He'll, after that, you'll always live on the edge and on fear. Yeah. In society and in gatherings, you will not be able to speak. Because you'll always fear that, you know what? Somebody might just mention it and somebody might just shut you up. You'll not be in a position to talk because the day you open your mouth, he'll turn and say to you, you're talking to me. You're not even a man. Go, take, go look after yourself. This is reality. You're not going to be able to go to the doctor either. And again, I'm telling you from experience from youngsters that have come to me. When I've told them to go to the doctor, you'll say, no, you know what, Ustadi, I can't go to the doctor. What if it leaks out? What if people come to know, okay, I'm suffering from this? You're going to have to live with that. That's the first harm. The second harm, you're not going to last long. Again, there's so many young kids, that's why I'm using, you know, indirect words. And they're appropriate within the house of Allah. You're not going to last long. 45, 50, you're tuss. You know, a balloon when it has no air, you're going to be like that. Yeah? Why? Because you abused yourself as you were growing up.
You abuse the blessing that Allah gave you. Anything, if you abuse it and you don't use it in the manner that it should be used, what happens? That thing doesn't last long. You've got a beautiful car. It takes diesel. You put petrol in it. What's going to happen? It's going to work. It's going to last long. You've got a, a blender. The instructions tell you don't crush ice. You've started crushing ice. How long is that blender going to work? Likewise, my young friends, if you don't follow Allah's instruction with regards to the tool and blessing that Allah gave you, then my young friend, come 45, 50, you'll be finished. But your wife won't. Do you understand? Again, she'll have needs. What will happen? How long is she going to make sabah? You know, only a few weeks ago, a 60-year-old woman came to me complaining about the same thing. Her husband's got diabetes, bichara, not, of a, you know, not through this. Diabetes and zahir about it. He's weak. In that department, he's very weak. But she can't make sabah. To such an extent that she said to her husband, find me another man and then divorce me. Find me another man and then divorce me. Come as come, do that much good with me. So what will happen? She's going to pack her bags. And then when she packs her bags, she's going to tell the world, the reason I pack my bags, because he ain't got the bottle anymore. Can you imagine the humiliation? <coughs> Another harm for our youngsters is, marriage is a great disappointment. Marriage becomes a great disappointment. I like it. Marriage is a great blessing of Allah. But marriage becomes a great disappointment. You know why it becomes a great disappointment? Because Zahir Bata, all his, you know, teenage years, he's been watching filth. So when he gets married, he's expecting fireworks. He's expecting exactly the same filth that he's been watching. So I get many youngsters come up to me and say, you know what, Sheikh? We're not happy yet. I'm not happy at home. And he'll, and he'll start complaining about his wife that, you know, she's just passive. There's no dynamite. Nothing exciting happens. I want to get rid, I want to get more, I want to move on. So then I start talking to them and start asking them okay, what, what, you know, what you're referring to. And you know what? When you get to the bottom of it, you find out that he's been watching filth. He's been watching filth and that's what he's expecting at home. And then you've got to explain. Then I explain to him like this. I say, you know what? Do you watch these action movies? He says, yeah, of course I do. I say, you know Arnold Schwarzenegger? When he jumps off that building, you know, sk skyscraper, and he just gets up again as if nothing's happened. Or, you know, what do you call it? There's, they're bombing him and they're shooting hundreds of bullets, and he's dodging every single one of them. I said, Do you believe in that? He says, Shit, you'd be stupid, yeah. Right? That's just uh, entertainment. That's not real. That's just entertainment. He gets the message because I say, You know what? You know what you've been watching wasn't real. If that's a multi-billion dollar industry, then this is also a multi-billion dollar industry. And then I say to him, you know what? Go home and do shukar. I said, go home and do shukar. I said, if that's how you found your woman or your wife to be, go home and prostrate before Allah and thank him for his blessings. He says, what are you on about? I said, you've taken, I said, have you ever driven a car? He says, yeah. I said, the first time you drove the car, did you... Uh, what do you call it? Uh, stole the engine. I says, yeah. How many times? I says, many times. I said, did you make a mess up of your first lesson? He says, yeah. I said, you know, afterwards, did it get better? He says, yeah. I says, you know what? Thank Allah for this blessing that Allah has given you. Yeah. Because I assure you, if there was dynamite at home, this wife of yours has been taking lessons from elsewhere. <laughs> and then he gets it. Yeah. And the biggest harm... <laughs> yeah. of this is it rips you of your modesty it takes away your haya you have nothing left I mean, I'll give you an example on this now I'm going to conclude 739 and, and you see this you will see a muhajjaba you know a woman wearing scarf yeah beautifully dressed only her face is exposed and she'll put on her she'll take a picture and she'll put it on on her Facebook page somebody will comment Oh, you look so beautiful. 
how beautiful you would look if your hair were exposed. Yeah? Egg in her own. Yeah? What she'll do next time around, she'll take off her scarf. And she'll show her beautiful hair. Time passes by. Now she's taken off her jubba, her abaya. And she'll put on her pick. She's getting more and more likes. And encouragement. What she'll start doing now is... Her dresses will become shorter and tighter. Time passes by. She'll not exposing her arms. There'll be no sleeves on her dresses. Time passes by. It's gone to a t-shirt. Time passes by. Again, my young friends, this is not an exaggeration. From fully covered head to toe, only face exposed, it gets to a stage where the sexting. It's all come off. You know the sad thing is, not even for a dime. Not that I'm saying sell yourself for dimes, but you get it, don't you guys? You know, the woman on the street sells her soul, she might get $10 in return. And this God-fearing woman that started God-fearing, yeah. stoop so low, I'm talking about males as well, stoop so low that she sells her izzat and her dignity. Not even for a dime. Halanki al hayau shubatum min al iman. Look how you know the, this attribute is what differentiates between humans and animals. Animals have no you know regard for right or wrong. They just follow their desires. Humans have a high haya imani, and this is haya that encourages them to do good and it protects them from all evil. So guys, I'm gonna sum it up and wrap it up. Like I said, these tools are here to stay. Yeah. And as time passes, Allah knows best what will come out tomorrow. Yeah. But it's important. It's important. Every person knows themselves. If you're from amongst those that's weak, that has no control, then I advise that you refrain from them to the best of your ability. Oh, come as come, do them in the presence of your mother and father and all the elders that even when you're affected by the shaitan, he can't get the better of you. Use them, but limit them. Take guidance on them. Keep a good ta'aluk with your scholars so that you get the, you know, imani, ghiza, nourishment on a daily basis, which helps, which, which helps in turn to protect you from these fitnas. Allah give me tawfiq, 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 Allah give me tawfiq,